Well, I think when you're investing, you're far better off focusing on the business and not spending a lot of time trying to figure out geopolitics and so on. And I think, I think that there was a time in the early 80s where the expectation was that Japan's GDP would exceed the US in some finite period of time because it had been growing so fast. And the Japanese economy basically stalled. So what was a juggernaut and miracle economy uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s did not do as most people had forecasted. China has had a spectacular run. I think it is an unprecedented run in human history in terms of the number of people lifted from poverty since the 1970s. It was a truly spectacular outcome. I mean, India would be a very small shadow of that in terms of what, what China was able to achieve. If India can achieve anything resembling that in the next few decades, we would not be able to recognize it. It would just be a different ball game. The place would look like Dubai everywhere, you know? And uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, I think that some of these trajectories become not so easy to figure out. One of the, I would say, one of the negatives that China is now dealing with is negative population growth. And negative population growth has been really, really difficult problem for governments to solve. So the average couple needs to have 2.1 kids for population to neither grow nor, nor drop. And Japan has been below that 2.1 for a long time. In fact, for the last few years, last couple of years, about 1.6 million people, for example, died last year in Japan and 800,000 were born. So you're losing close to a million people a year, which is a very significant rate of decline taking place. In the case of Korea, it is far more extreme. So the, the Japanese couple average children is like 1.4 or so, instead of 2.1, which is quite low. Korea is less than 0.8. That is a shockingly low rate. I mean, in the case of Japan, you're seeing a less than 1% annual rate of population decline. In the case of Korea, you would see a lot more than percent population decline. And both these countries have historically, and in, including China, all three of these countries have historically, but especially Japan and Korea, have been very reluctant to bring in immigrants. And, and I think the Japanese now are beginning to shift on that. And my guess is the Koreans, their concern is that the homogeneous culture would get destroyed. And it's a legitimate concern. And so the citizens of the country have a right to make a decision how they want the future to unfold. But, and, and I think with China, I don't know whether the government policies of basically trying to get more couples to have more kids, more couples to even just get married, that's a big challenge even in Korea now, is just getting couples to marry, is very uphill. And then the cost to raise a kid keeps going up so much and, uh, and so on. So one of the amazing things about the United States is that there are, it is an anomaly actually for a advanced economy to have a growing population. Generally speaking, when GDP per capita incomes rise significantly and you get to being an advanced civilization and women are in the workforce and so on, and with a lot of independence and equal rights and so on, the natural outcome is a drop in the birth rate. And the United States actually amazingly has been able to keep up a birth rate over 2.1. It's now, I think, uh, right on the edge or actually below that now, but with the inclusion, with the inclusion of immigration. So if we didn't have immigration in the United States, we would have a declining population. The, the birth rate has been below 2.1 for a while. But when you add immigration to the US, when I came to the country, you know, two score years ago, when I came two score years ago, there were about 250 million people or so in the country. We are now approaching about 335 million in the country. So it's gone up. It's, it's a good 30 plus percent increase over 40 years, which is great. And so I, I think, I think my, my general take is that 
one will face some headwinds in most businesses uh, when one is investing in economies with declining populations. You would need to either have a mousetrap that most of the population doesn't have, and therefore there will be a large market that will be going after those products, like NVIDIA's products, for example. Or you would need to be an export juggernaut or something where you're leveraging country resources, but your real market is the, is the, is the world and, and so on. But if you're a you know, standard consumer products company, domestically focused in a competitive market, you are facing a lot of headwinds because your, your market is shrinking. So I think that having said all of that, I think one is better off focusing on the micro versus the macro. I think when you look at an investment I made in Alibaba, for example, which was a mistake, that investment kind of went sideways because there were things the state did which came from left field. And yeah, probably should have paid more attention, but like I said, it's, it's hard to predict these types of things when the past environment has been so benign for such a long time. So we'll always run into that. We'll always run into things that don't work out for a number of reasons. Like I said, the a 40, 50% error rate is just par for the course. Warren Buffett would have a 50% error rate in businesses that he's buying. So, and he's the best of the best. So, so we, we are probably, like I said, even though we had the mistake in Alibaba and so on, I would still be a proponent of being very focused on the core business rather than trying to figure out a lot of macro things.